Hebrews chapter 3. If you found that, why don't you stand? We'll read together God's Word. Hebrews chapter 3, we'll start in verse 1 and read down to verse 6. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of our God stands forever. Let's begin right there, verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now, Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Join me as we pray. <clears throat> Father, we have sung of your mercy and grace. We've sung that it even makes us want to shout. But sometimes, Lord, we need a clearer picture of you. Sometimes our souls hurt so bad, we need you to minister to us. Sometimes, even as believers... We feel separated. These are your children, Lord, men and women that have come in faithfully today to worship and are in need. And so, Father, I pray that, that you would keep me from straying from what the Bible says. And by your Spirit, use that to minister to the hearts of your people and find us faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Just as tears in your eyes, <clears throat> literal tears, when you cry and you have water coming into your eyes, just as tears in your eyes blur your vision, you can't see, just as tears in your eyes blur your vision, trouble in your world makes it actually hard to see joy or to be joyful. And it really doesn't take much. It doesn't have to be something that just devastates you. It can be something that would otherwise not be that bad. A, a lost pet, a sick child, a wayward friend, a failed job. It doesn't take that much. Every one of those things steals joy. Every one of them. When the car breaks down and the kids don't do right, it just, just takes joy. Or, or, or maybe, maybe the problem is your own making. Or at least in your own head. Sometimes we just get in our own, just can't stop thinking about it. When you're unreasonably anxious or, or, or unthoughtfully sinful. Truthfully, so, so much of our own pain so much of the pain that we go through is oftentimes self-inflicted and undiagnosed sin. If you don't think about it, you, you need to. Sin can, <clears throat> sin can make us afraid. Sin can um, make us defensive. Sin can make us hard. Uh, sin can make us sad. Sin can make it seem like every mountain is unclimbable and every problem is unsolvable. So it muddies our minds. It makes it so we can't think. We can't think properly. Can't think clearly. And this passage right here, this paragraph, is written to a group of people that are right on the edge of panic. It's written to Christians. It's important for us to remember that. It's written to Christians. We don't know exactly what they're going through but the tone of it is calling their attention back 
to get it right, here's what the preacher did in chapter 1. The preacher laid down the doctrine of Jesus as being fully God. You go back and read chapter 1, you see him raising up Christ fully God. And then in chapter 2, here's what he does. He gives us the doctrine of Jesus being fully man so that we have a full picture of the Savior, Jesus Christ. And now having laid all of that down, here in chapter 3, the preacher pauses to collect our hearts, to get our thoughts right, so that you and I can think clearly. And that's all I want to do today, to help us think clearly. Because truthfully, I, I actually know what some of you are dealing with. Today I want you all walking out of here at least with a, with a glint of Christian joy in your heart. Because when we think clearly, we actually do live joyfully. When we think clearly, we live joyfully. Or, or just start at the back of that sentence. To live joy, joyfully, we've got to make sure we are thinking clearly. How do we do that? Where, where do we start? Well, the preacher starts us right there at the foundation. Here's the first one, number one. We need to think clearly about Jesus. We need to think clearly about Jesus. In fact, that statement seems to be the driving force of this entire paragraph. We'll get to it. But let's pick it up in verse 1. Look what the preacher says right there in verse 1. Read it with me. There, therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. There is a danger that many Christians fall into that many people may be sitting in this room right now. There is a danger that many Christians fall into, and there is a road that many churches actually travel down. That is not actually denying Jesus. The, the, the trouble, the danger, the road is thinking about Jesus in a way that is accommodating to you. To think, thinking about Jesus in a way that makes it seem like all of your proclivities are okay. To think about Jesus in such a way that he's not actually clashing with our culture, but dovetailing with our culture. And our task as Christians, Bible-believing Christians, our task is to always look to the Scripture and receive Jesus as the Scripture presents him. And as we live in the world that we're living in, that will become more and more of a challenge. I mean, there's a problem in the text. Here's, here's what the preacher's addressing. In the text, the people that heard this for the very, very first time, they were uh, in danger of considering Jesus, because they were Jewish, they were in danger of considering Jesus in light of Moses. And the point that the preacher's making is you got the order wrong. You don't need to consider Jesus in light of Moses. You, you need to consider Moses in light of Jesus. Now, here's the point. You can just sort of draw for yourself. Too many of us actually consider Jesus in light of the problem we're dealing with because that problem feels so immediate and it's in our faces when in fact as Christians, we need to reverse the order. We should be dealing with and thinking about the problem we got out there through the lens of of Jesus, you see. So that Jesus is the interpretive lens and not the problem. We don't let culture tell us how to interpret Jesus. We have Jesus telling us how to interpret cult culture. We think Christianly. We think about the person of Jesus, his, his deity and his humanity. We think about his work on the cross as a substitute for us. We, we think about his resurrection. We think about his lordship. We think about his intercession. I mean, that, this is what a Christian woman considers when she considers Jesus. When you think about Jesus, I mean, this, this is what the preacher will say. Uh, most of you know uh, the passage, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. If you know anything about Hebrews, that's the passage you know. It's the one after the whole, the list of all of the, the famous people in the Old Testament, the, the hall of faith in chapter 11. Chapter 12, he picks it up. In uh, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And you know that famous line? 
fixing our eyes on Jesus or looking to Jesus, it's the same word that's here in chapter 3, verse 1. Consider Jesus. Studying this passage, I go to John MacArthur, often look at his commentary. I have to go to John MacArthur after I have everything done. Uh, because I'll go before, it's so good, his outlines are so right, that I just want to take that and just preach that to you. And uh, that's called plagiarism, and you get in trouble for that. So I can't do that. But I, I was looking at John MacArthur <clears throat> commentary, on, and he, got, he spends a lot of time with this word, consider. And he says that the word consider means to put your mind, put your mind on Jesus and let it remain there so that you might understand who he is and what he wills. You know what this speaks to? I, I think this is something we miss out on. Maybe it's because we're so busy or there's so many other things coming into our lives. I mean, you can pick up your phone, you can, just, you can see everything on your own phone. There's so much coming in and, and we're so distracted all the time or so easily distracted. I, I just think we don't spend enough time thinking about and meditating, consider meditating on Christ. What we have here is a command. It's a reminder that, um, that he is sufficient. I like the word sufficiency. So you might even want to put it down. Sufficiency of Christ. That means that he is able. The old preacher just say that won't he do it. Yeah, that, that's the sufficiency. He, he is able to, to forgive. He's able to sustain. He's able to help you. He's able to heal. He's able to strengthen. He is able to bring back the joy that you remember. And so to help us consider Jesus, look what the preacher does right there in verse 1. Here's what he does. He gives us two descriptors in verse 1 and then fills it out further in verses 2 through 6. Let's go back to verse 1 and see the descriptors with me. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus. Here come the descriptors. The apostle and high priest of our confession. Apostle and high priest. Here is the only time in the book of Hebrews that you find the word apostle. Here is the only time in the entire Bible that Jesus is called an apostle. We hear the word apostle, we think about the 12 apostles out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's a, that's a, that's a big A apostle. That's the office of apostle. We must remember that the word apostle actually has a meaning. It means the, those that are sent. And so he is the apostle, the sent one of of our confession, but not just the apostle. He is also the high priest. This entire book, the book of Hebrews, is, is focused on making sure that we understand Jesus as our high priest. Now, for us to get the punch, let's keep the two words together. Sometimes I like to separate and define over here and then define over there. Keep the two together, because the, the writer's done that. The apostle and high priest of our confession. As the apostle, he is from God sent to us. As the high priest, he is for us interceding to God. As the apostle, he speaks to us from God. As the high priest, he speaks for us to God. You, you understand that, that as our high priest, he is the sacrifice. He, he, is, he is the sent one. In fact, the word apostle, we, we've said this, it means to be sent Remember what Jesus said? As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you, is the word apostle. If we understand the word apostle as sent, then we understand that Jesus, here is Jesus as the rescuing agent sent from God the Father. It's God the Father sending God the Son to save us. If he's the high priest, here is Jesus giving himself as a substitute on the cross, taking the punishment in the place of sinners. Look, when, when, Jesus, when Jesus is called the apostle, the apostle and high priest of our when he's called the apostle, it reminds us that God the Father has sent forth Jesus the Son and he sent him on a mission. When Jesus is called the high priest, it reminds us that that mission is a sacrificial mission to save his people. To consider Jesus as the apostle and the high priest of our confession, it means that we ponder and wonder what is it he's done for us. We consider Jesus as the apostle and high priest. We, we, we weigh out his dignity. We, 
We dwell on His excellency. We submit to His authority. We gather on a Sunday and we behold Him and, then, and we worship Him and we rest in Him. He is the apostle and high priest of our confession. That's not all the preacher says. He, he gets carried away and he keeps moving forward. And the preacher expands on how we are to view Christ. J join me there. I want, you to, I want you to think of Christ as not just the apostle and the high priest. I want you to think of Christ as the builder. The builder. Remember what Jesus said to Peter? Jesus said to Peter when, uh, about the confession um, upon this rock. Jesus says, I will build my church. Keep that in mind as we go to verses uh, 2 through 6. As I read it to you, let's finish out the sentence and, and think of Jesus as the builder. Go back with me. Let's just start in verse 1. Therefore, holy, holy brothers, who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him. Here it comes. Faithful. Jesus. He was faithful to who? God. Jesus came, lived as a man. Faithful. He, he, he lived in such a way, completely perfect, in a way that we can't do it. He lived for us. Who was faithful to him, who appointed him. That's God. Just as Moses was also faithful in God's house. So now Moses, he started to compare Jesus to Moses. He's talking to Jewish people. They would hold Moses in the highest regard. And they were tempted to, be, to fall back into Judaism. And now the preacher's making the argument that Moses certainly was worthy of honor, but Jesus worthy of more. Verse 3, For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. So Moses is part of the house. Jesus is the builder of the house. He's making his case. It's funny, in verse 4, uh, verse 4 is sort of a parenthesis. He stops in verse 4 in the middle of an argument and gives proof for the existence of God. That's what verse 4 is. It's, a, it's an apologetic, verse 4. He says, every house is built by someone. So if you see a house, you know that there's a builder. It didn't just get there. You see the house, somebody built that house. Every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. And he's saying, look around at creation. You see all this stuff that's here. It didn't just get here. God did that. He's the builder. Okay, verse 5, he picks the argument back up. Now, Moses was faithful in all of God's house. Moses is a servant. His job to testify to the things that would be spoken later. He didn't stop with Moses. His job as a servant, testify to things spoken later. Okay, verse 6, but Christ, first time you see the word Christ in the book of Hebrews, right there. But Christ is faithful, not as a servant, but over all of his house. Faithful over God's house as a son. And we, that's us, the church, we're his house. Now, pause right there. I'll get to that last bit in just a moment. The preacher has used the word House six times in just three verses, right there, just piles it on. House, house. Why? So, if you're reading, you think, why is he doing that? He uses that word six times in these three verses to demonstrate how Jesus is the builder and is superior to Moses. And then back up, verse. I'll just show it to you. Verses two and three. Do you see? Verses two and three tell us that Jesus is the builder. And Moses is just part of the house. The preacher even says down in verse 5, you, you can see in verse 5, that Moses is faithful in God's house as a servant, but Jesus is the son. He's the builder and owner of the house. He keeps like this. The job of Moses, Moses had a job. The job of Moses was to point to Christ. Remember what Jesus said to the scribe? The scribe would write down the law and the Pharisees. John chapter 5, verse 39. Jesus said to those, the scribes and the Pharisees, you search the scriptures. He's talking about Moses. You look at what Moses wrote because you think that in them you'll find eternal life. Don't you know that it is them, Moses, 
who actually bear witness to me. So what we have here is Jesus himself saying that the entire Old Testament is one large era pointing to the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. So Moses, Moses' ministry didn't exist just for the Jews. Moses' ministry existed to testify to the things that would come. The Old Testament is there to point us to Christ. The typological patterns, the unique promises, the clear prophecies. So all of that could be said maybe in one sentence. And you might be thinking, why don't you just say it in one sentence then? All of that could be said in one sentence. In, in Moses, we have a promise. In Jesus, we have a fulfillment. And it is vital for you as a brother or sister in Christ. It's vital for you as a Christian to think clearly about Jesus. That you don't look at Jesus through the terrible problem, turn the thing around. We look at the problem through looking at Jesus. It's, it's vital for you as a Christian to think clearly about Jesus so that you actually can then live joyfully regardless of what's going on. I just want you, I just want you to know that he is worthy of your unwavering attention. Something else to consider, though. We are talking about uh, thinking clearly about Jesus. That's the first point. Let me uh, drop down to the second point, but let's go up to verse 1 to see it. Here's the second point. Number two, we need to think clearly about ourselves. Us, individually. Men and women here at Hickory Grove. Let me show you what I mean, thinking clearly about ourselves. Go back with me to verse 1 and notice what he calls the people. We, we know, before I read it in verse 1, we know that this paragraph is actually addressed specifically to Christians in the congregation. So any congregation is going to have uh, those that are sold out to Christ, uh, those that are on the fence, and then those that are not. So, so sitting here today, uh, we have people in this congregation that really whose hearts are just, when you hear the Bible and you worship, you resonate with that, and right now there's a real passion in your life for the Lord there are others sitting in this congregation that uh, are Christians, and yet some of that is just really cooled off, or there's some sin in your life, or you're struggling with something. There are other people sitting here that uh, really nothing is resonating with you at all. You actually aren't a believer. You're on the outside. We'll do something in a little bit that sort of paints the picture of that. We take the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is for the congregation. For Christians, we do that together. We celebrate what Christ has done for us. Those that are not Christians... Don't take the Lord's Supper. It is a, just a tangible reminder of those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ. And the way this is written, you see that it is written specifically to Christians. Let me show you where I get it, right there in verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers, that can be translated brothers and sisters, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling. Holy brothers, to, to describe it. Holy brothers, heavenly calling. Let's start with one. Holy brothers, brothers and sisters. In fact, let's cut that one in half. Let's deal with the word holy. What does it mean to be holy? Does it mean to be Mother Teresa? Does it mean to be uh, pious and walk around with your hands clasped, never do anything wrong? That is not the New Testament definition of holy. That word holy reminds us that we have been cleansed of our sin by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus dying on the cross. It's, it's the gospel. We, we package it up like this. God is holy, created all of us in his image. You have dignity because you were created in the image of God. That image of God in all of us has been disfigured because of our own sin. That sin is, is not just something harmful to us. It is an affront to God. And as a holy God, he will not have fellowship with us. We are broken the fellowship is broken. We are dead in sin. But God is not just just. He's also loving and kind. And in that love, he sends his son, Jesus, chapters 1 and 2, who is fully God and fully man, comes and lives a perfect life where we can't. He does that on our behalf. Goes to the cross, and there at the cross, what he does is takes the just punishment. Remember the punishment? That goes on Jesus. 
He gives us the earned righteousness of his perfect life. That's what we get. And that happens, the way you become a Christian is turn from your sin and believe what Jesus has done for you on the cross. So if that has happened to you, you now are actually living in the grace of God and you are a saint. Sometimes we mix this up and we end up saying, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Yes, that's true, but you aren't left in sin. You're the overwhelming thing that identifies you is not a sinner. You now are a saint. You've been transformed. It doesn't mean you don't sin anymore. It does mean your nature, who you are, is changed. You are not an outsider. You're an insider. You're not a slave. You're a son or a daughter. So, so here's the, the title, Holy Brothers. That's holy. How about brothers? Holy brothers, you, brothers and sisters, you, you know what that is? That's a reminder that we are f family. This is so important for Christians to get. It's so important in the congregation. It's so important in the world we live in that you belong, that, that you're one of us, that you are accepted, holy brothers, that you are loved, that you, uh, that you, that you have people. If you are a member of Hickory Grove Baptist Church, you have people. We are it. Congratulations. You know, it's a reminder. It's a reminder with, with, with so many things that actually separate us. There's a, a whole lot of differences we have. This is a reminder that we have been united in Christ, even though there are so many things that distinguish us from one another. There, there's an infinite number of things that you might say make us different. There's one overwhelming thing that holds us together. That is the death of resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here, brothers and sisters, right there is the cure for racism. This is what we believe in Ephesians 2, that God has broken down the wall, and in Christ, he's created one new race, holy brothers. You know what that means? That means that you have been cleansed, you are part of a family, you have security, you have responsibility. We need to think clearly of ourselves, holy brothers. Look at that other descriptor in verse uh, 1, holy brothers who've received a heavenly calling. Do you see that? Who share in a heavenly calling. What is a heavenly calling? Here is the, a calling that, that is initiated by God in heaven. Here is the God-initiated work of how God actually saves us. What does God do to save us? If you had to write it down, it'd be, the old preachers used to call it effectual, effectual call, that the call of God actually has an effect. Something happens when the Spirit of God invades your life. It is uh, shown most visibly in, in uh, the, the raising of Lazarus. Remember that, how that happened? Jesus stood at the grave and called out Lazarus and his, the voice. It was the call. It wasn't Lazarus make, waiting to make a decision. He was dead. Jesus raised him with his voice. You, you understand that, that salvation, the heavenly calling. Uh, what did Jonathan Edwards say? Jonathan Edwards told us that um, the only thing that we bring to salvation is the sin that makes it necessary. This is the heavenly calling. So, so that when we think about ourselves, we think of God. God initiating this in your life. God loving you. It's not dependent on you reaching up, you finding out, you seeking. You think that it's the grace of God. You're a holy brother or sister that has shared in a heavenly calling. There's, there's confidence and joy in that and hope and, and forgiveness. And when we rightly think of ourselves, you can start understanding you are a recipient of, of God's grace. And it makes it so that you can live your life joyfully. I, I want to live my life joyfully. To do so, i got to think clearly. I need to think clearly about Jesus. I need to think clearly about myself. I'll just uh, tag one more thing. It's down at the end of verse 6. 
Number three, we need to think clearly about being a Christian. What does it mean to actually be a Christian? You see it at the end of verse 6 when we're called his house. Join me there in verse 6. Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and now it's to us. And we are his house, the church. If. We are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Hold fast. You know, this ends with a, um, verse 6 is a comfort and a challenge. The comfort is, we, you, are his house. You're in. That's a comfort. And the challenge is, if we hold fast. This is bothersome. If you're a, Christ, if you're a, if you're a Baptist Christian, you've always heard the once saved, always saved. This, this gets next to you a little bit. Because nowhere in the Bible, you go to the book of Hebrews, uh, nowhere in the Bible do we find these conditional sentences like we do in the book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews, what he does is, there's a crisis going on, and he brings us this immediacy to our faith. And he says, why are you resting on something that happened 20 years ago when there's been no evidence in your life since then? We are saved by grace. We are secure in His mercy. If you're a believer, you're a survivor. But that mercy is, that mercy is seen. It is present. It is immediate. Perseverance is what's happening right now. This is the very opposite of saying that you got saved years ago and got baptized when you were 12 and nothing's happened since then. And you're not, concerned, you're not concerned about sin. You're not convicted by the Holy Spirit. You have no interest in the things of the Lord. You can't even show up to church on a Sunday. Brothers and sisters, eternal security is so much more than once saved, always saved. Eternal security is once saved, obviously saved. And, and the words at the end of verse 6, they are joyful. It's not a threat. The, 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 the words there at the end of verse 6 says that you, you're in the midst of a terrible crisis. You are God's house when you hold fast. And look what you're holding on to. You're holding fast to this confidence. It's great confidence that you are secure in Christ. Great boasting in our hope that God is with you. It's what we hang on to. The power of God given to us at the cross of Jesus applied to our lives to make us holy brothers share in a heavenly calling God's house. You see, when we think, when we think clearly, we can live joyfully. I want you to think clearly about Jesus, the apostle, and high priest of our confession. I want you to think clearly about yourself, that you are a holy brother or sister, received a heavenly calling. I want you to think clearly about being the church, that this is the, the house. He says the, the house of God, it is those that are holding fast to our confession. One of the things that we do that fundamentally displays Christianity is we take the Lord's Supper together. You probably got chalice when you came in. You can even start taking the element off if you like. We, we do this as a congregation. We don't do it solo. We do this as a congregation because it reminds us that we're not only communing with God, it is a reminder we commune with one another. We are family, brothers and sisters in Christ. Only God can see the heart. I can't judge whether or not a person is a believer. That's, that's God's business. What we have to do with the church is though, set up ways where we understand. We get those out of the Bible. The Bible says that once you are saved, you are baptized. And so we use that as a symbol. Being buried with Christ and raised to new life. The front door into the church. 
the Lord's Supper becomes the very first fellowship of the church. A lot of people, especially when they're young, they look forward to taking the Lord's Supper after being baptized. What I'd like to ask, if, if you have some question of whether or not you are in Christ and you, you've not been baptized, then it's good for you to maybe to pause and not take the Lord's Supper. Let this be for those that are genuinely or, or secure in that. If you, however, are a Christian and um, you've been baptized and yet you've not been living for the Lord, there's no evidence. The, the, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11 to not take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. It may be good for you to hold off this time. And then let's, let's work through what is, the, what is the sin that's kept you out of fellowship with God. For the vast majority of you that are here, this Lord's Supper is here to remind us of what Christ has done to center our hearts on the Lord Jesus. I'd like to say a word of prayer, and then we'll take the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Father, I pray that by your grace you would minister to the hearts of your children, hurting men and women. Draw them close. God, I pray that this tangible reminder would be useful by the Spirit of God to, to draw people from being outside of Christ to being inside of Christ. And Lord, today we remember how good you've been to us in Jesus. In Christ's name we pray, amen. The Bible says that in 1 Corinthians 11, that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this bread is given... This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The Bible also says that in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant, the new covenant, which is given in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat the bread, drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Today, if for some reason you were not able to take the Lord's Supper, whether it be your, your, some sin or you're just not in Christ, our final song is a song of closing worship. It's also an invitation. When we're singing it, our pastors are just going to be on, they're on the front row. They're not standing at the aisle waiting. They're just sitting on the front row. They're right there. If you'd like to come and have a pastor pray with you, pray for you, or talk to you about what it means to give your life to Christ, when we sing, the church just is inviting you to come forward. Most of you, you'll stand and sing. And today, I hope when we close with this song that you sing with a joy that is real and a joy that lasts because you are in Christ. Pray with me now. Father, thank you. Thank you for the Lord's Day. Thank you for the Lord's Supper. Thank you for the chance to, to worship, to center our lives on you. Lord, I pray that this might be a turning point for so many that have not lived in joy. Pray for men and women here that even through this whole service have just hurt. God, I pray you draw them close that your Holy Spirit would minister a healing power. I pray for those that are struggling with the sin and just can't let go. God, that you would overcome that. You, you have shown us your effectual call. God, I pray that for a young man or woman, I pray that they could see that you are sufficient. You are all they need. God, thank you for a good day to celebrate Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Would you stand, please, as we sing together?